Welcome back to Philologic. Today, we're going to be talking about the traditional square of opposition. This video is going to cover a lot of information, but I promise I'll try my best to explain things as clearly and simply as possible. Let's get started. In our last video in this series, we talked about how there are four types of statements in categorical logic. There's A-type, E-type, I-type, and O-type. Well, these types of statements all bear inferential relations to one another. Okay, but what does that mean? What that means is that if you're given the truth value of one of the statements, you can immediately know the truth values of some of the others. For example, if I know that an A-type statement is true, say, that all dogs are mammals, then I automatically know that its corresponding O-type statement, that some dogs are not mammals, is false. It's important to note that these relations only hold when the statements are about the same things. There are a bunch of these relations between the four types of statements, and the traditional square of opposition is a neat way of organizing them. We're going to draw up the square little by little, working our way through each relation until you're an expert. First, you place the letters A, E, I, O like this. Now, the first relation we'll cover is the one we just briefly talked about. A-type and O-type statements are contradictories. So are E-type and I-type statements. When two statements are contradictory, they must always have opposite truth values. As just stated, this relation holds specifically between A-type and O-type statements and between E-type and I-type statements. If we know that the A-type statement is true, then we know that the O-type statement must be false. If the A-type statement is false, then the O-type statement is true. The same holds in the other direction. Given the truth value of one of these, we will always know the value of the other. If all dogs are mammals, then it can't be the case that some dogs are not mammals. Similarly, if some fruits aren't bananas, then it can't be the case that all fruits are bananas. The same goes for E-type and I-type statements. If one is true, then the other must be false, and vice versa. If it's true that no cats are dogs, then it can't be true that some cats are dogs. If it's true that some bananas are fruits, then it can't be true that no bananas are fruits. Riveting stuff, I know. That's everything you need to know about contradictories, so let's get back to the square and see the next relation. The next relation we'll look at holds between A-type and E-type statements. A-type and E-type statements are contraries. Contrary statements cannot both be true, but they can both be false. As just stated, this relation holds specifically between A-type and E-type statements. This means that if the A-type is true, then we know that the E-type must be false, since only one of them can be true at a time. If the E-type is true instead, then the A-type must be false. But that's all we can know. If the only thing we know is that, say, the E-type is false, then we don't know anything about the A-type. It could go either way. Let's consider some examples of each case. If we know that all dogs are mammals, then we know that it cannot be true that no dogs are mammals. So the A-type being true guarantees that the E-type is false. If we know that no dogs are cats, then we know that it can't be the case that all dogs are cats. So, the E-type being true guarantees that the A-type is false. But, if all we know is that the statement we're dealing with is false, we can't infer anything about its counterpart. Knowing that no birds can fly does not guarantee anything about whether all birds can fly. Knowing that no cats are mammals tells us nothing about whether all cats are mammals. These examples are simple, and so you already know their truth values, but remember that what matters here is what you can infer from a statement. You can't infer anything about an A-type statement based on a false E-type statement. The same goes vice versa. When it comes to contraries, you'll only be capable of making inferences given a true A or E-type statement. The next relation we'll consider is between I-type and O-type statements. I-type and O-type statements are each other's subcontraries. Subcontraries are pretty much the opposite of contraries. They cannot both be false at the same time, but they can both be true. As I just showed, this relation holds between I-type and O-type statements. 
if we know that the I type statement is false, then the O type must be true. And if we know that the O type is false, then we know that the I type must be true. But once again, that's all we can know. If either of these is true, then we cannot say anything about the other. So to see some examples, since it's false that some birds are cats, we can safely say that it's true that some birds are not cats. Now, I know what you're thinking. What do you mean some birds are not cats? No birds are cats. That's true. But if no birds are cats, then it's also true that some birds are not cats. In logic, some just means at least one. And it's definitely true that at least one bird is not a cat, since we know that no birds are cats. Isn't logic fun? Moving on, since it's false that some dogs are not mammals, it must be true that some dogs are mammals. Realize, though, that we can't infer anything from a true I or O type statement. Just because we know that some dogs are cute pets, it doesn't follow that the statement some dogs are not cute pets is true or false. It's just not an inference we can make, and I'm sure it's something people disagree on. Some of you are wrong, of course. The next and final relation, and the most complicated, is subalternation. This relation holds between A-type and I-type statements. And it holds between E-type and O-type statements. Notice that the arrow only points down. This will be important. The rule for subalternation goes like this. When the superaltern, the statement at the top of the square, is true, then we know that the subaltern, the statement at the bottom of the square, is also true. This is why the arrow points the way that it does. When the subaltern is false, then we know that the superaltern is also false. But that's all we can know. If the superaltern is false, then we don't know anything about the subaltern. And when the subaltern is true, that doesn't tell us anything about the superaltern. So, for example, if it's true that all dogs are mammals, then it must be true that some dogs are mammals. If it's false that some dogs are cats, then it's also false that all dogs are cats. If, however, it's true that some birds can fly, this doesn't tell us anything about whether all birds can fly. Similarly, if it's false that all dogs are corgis, this tells us nothing about whether some dogs are corgis. If the superaltern is false, then we can't know anything about the truth value of the subaltern based solely on this information. The same goes for if the subaltern is true. Just to be clear, because these statements are so simple, you likely already know their truth values. What's important here is whether you can infer their truth value based on the given information. If you didn't know anything about birds, and someone just told you that some of them could fly, this wouldn't tell you anything about whether they all could. For all you know, they might all fly. Or, of course, they might not. Moving on to E and O type statements, if we know that no dogs are cats, then we also know that some dogs are not cats. If we know that it's false that some cats are not mammals, then it's also false that no cats are mammals. But realize, just because we know that some mammals are not dogs, doesn't mean we know whether no mammals are dogs. And just because we know it's false that no fruits are apples, doesn't mean we know whether some fruits are not apples. If this is at all complicated or hard to follow, that's perfectly all right. With enough practice, you'll definitely become a pro. And I promise you that I got tripped up a few times recording this myself. And there you have it, the complete traditional square of opposition. Let's have a quick recap, and then we'll move on to the last bit of this video, where we'll practice what we've learned a bit. First, we covered contradictories. This relation held between the A and O type and the E and I type statements. The relation just states that the truth values of these statements will always be opposites. So, if the A type is true, then the O type is false. And if the E type is false, then the I type is true. And so on. Then came the contraries, which were the A-type and E-type statements. Contraries cannot both be true at the same time, but they can both be false. 
This means that when you know one of them is true, then you immediately know the other must be false. But if all you know is that one of them is false, then you can't infer anything about the other. Then we had the subcontraries, which were the I-type and O-type statements. Subcontraries cannot be false at the same time, but they can both be true. So when you know one of them is false, you can immediately infer that the other is true. But if you know one is true, you cannot say anything about the other. Finally, we had subalternation, which holds between A-type and I-type statements and between E-type and O-type statements. Whenever the superaltern is true, the subaltern must be true. Whenever the subaltern is false, the superaltern must be false. And that's all we can know. Finally, here's a little practice. I recommend you pause the video before I give the answer and try these out for yourself. We'll try four of these. Let's say A is true. What can we infer about E, O, and I? Here would be a good place to pause the video. Well, A and E are contraries, so they can't both be true. That means E must be false. A is the superaltern of I, and when the superaltern is true, the subaltern must also be true, so I must be true. Finally, O is the contradictory of A, and so must have the opposite truth value. This means O is false. Okay, let's say, then, that A is false. This would be a good place to pause the video. Well, since A and E are contraries, we can't know anything about E. And, since A is I's superaltern, we can't know anything about I either. But we'll always know the contradictory, and in this case, O must be true. Let's say that O is false. Well, if O is false, then its subcontrary must be true, since they can't both be false. We'll also know that A must be true, since A is O's contradictory. And we'll know that E must be false, since E is O's superaltern and O is false. Finally, let's say I is true. Well, since I is true and A is I's superaltern, we can't know anything about A. I's contradictory, however, will have to be false. Finally, we won't know anything about I's subcontrary O. In order to get more comfortable with the traditional square of opposition, I recommend doing exactly this. Just place the letters in the right positions, give one of them a truth value, and then see if you can consistently infer the truth values of the other statements. Once you're good at this, that'll mean you've got these relations down. One last thought. I know we covered a lot of information in this video, and a lot of this stuff tends to be somewhat unintuitive to a lot of people. It's perfectly normal to have to rewatch the video, and please, if you've got any questions, just ask them in the comments section. I'll be sure to respond. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.